السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين قال الله في كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر كيف ضرب الله مثلا كلمة طيبة كشجرة طيبة أصلها ثابت وفرعها في السماء تؤتي أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس لعلهم يتذكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد I'd first like to begin by uh, congratulating you all on a very blessed new year and I sincerely hope that this new year brings with it much blessings and much forgiveness and much mercy from Allah it is of course a very auspicious time when we get together with family members and uh, we congratulate them and we share gifts and laughter and goodwill and food but it is also a time to count our blessings from Allah as well um, it is a time to also remember our blessings that God has bestowed upon us in the past year and to ask for more in the coming years. And so I sincerely hope that inshallah this, this year brings joy and success and prosperity to you and your friends and your family inshallah. I won't take too much of your time but I want to uh, mention the legacy and the life of a lady whom we are commemorating in this week who was known for her noble lineage and her upright morals and her bravery and her courage and her devotion to the cause of the household of the Prophet. That is Lady Fatima bint Hizam al Kilabiya, aka Umul Banin. And Umul Banin was a lady who stood out among the rest of the ladies in that she was known to have come from a noble lineage. She was known to have great morals. She was known to have great character, patience, and great devotion. And usually when we mention Umm al we mention what happened after the passing of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and how Imam Ali alayhi salam, Amir al-Mu'mineen sought to remarry and he sought a spouse, a wife for a very special reason. And we mention what we remember is what stands out is her reaction to what took place on the day of Ashura in Karbala and her reaction upon seeing Lady Zainab alayhi salam and Al Imam Zain al Abidin and the caravan which came back to Medina, the caravan which was carrying the household of the Prophet. But really her legacy extends much more than that. We know that after that tragedy, she was known for continuing to spread the message that Imam Hussein had passed away for. She would eulogize Imam Hussein. She would eulogize her own son, Abu Fadl al Abbas. She would lament them. There is even poetry which is attributed to this very noble lady, which she recites in honor of her brave son, Abu Fadl al Abbas. And Abu Fadl al Abbas, of course, was known for his bravery at a, at a very young age, so 
even though she was not there in Karbala, where he exhibited his greatest act of bravery in defense of the household, his household, the household of his brother. However, he had led a life of bravery all throughout, from his childhood until his adulthood and until his martyrdom. So he was known and she knew this about, about him and this is why she, um, she had lines of poetry in which she would eulogize and she would remember and honor her son and, and the martyrs of Karbala. We know that she came from a very valiant family, a very brave family, from both her mother's side and from her father's side. And in fact, if you trace her lineage, she shares an ancestor with the Prophet Muhammad And that is his grandfather, Abdul Munaf. We know that Imam Ali alayhi salam, after the passing of his dear wife Fatima, wanted to remarry. And most of you know the story of how he had approached first his brother Aqil. And why did he approach his brother Aqil? Aqil, it is said, was knowledgeable in the field of genealogy. He recognized the families, he recognized the prominent families, he recognized the prominent tribes. He knew who came from which family, and that family or that tribe, what were they known for? If they were known for courage, or bravery, or generosity, or maybe stupidity, or anything else. People who were familiar with genealogy were able to detect these things and because he was an expert in this field, Imam Ali approached him. Because when he sought to remarry, he didn't only seek a wife that would be able to uh, you know, cook and, and clean and satisfy him and you know, sew his clothes or mend his clothes or whatever. We know that when he sought to remarry, he sought a woman from a family which were known for their bravery, which were known for their valiance. And her family before her had a very great history, even before the advent of Islam. They were known for their bravery in the battlefield and they were known for their uh, valiance and, and they were known for their uh, muruwa, basically. Uh, and Imam Ali salam, had made it a point that he would find a woman who was known for her, uh, f from a family who was known for bravery and valiance. But also remember that when Fatima passed away, she left behind four orphans. She left behind Al Hassan Wal Hussein. She left behind Zainab and Umm Kulthum. And so when Fatima Al Kilabiya, who matched the name of Fatima alayhi salam, when she came into the home of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and, and this, this is where she really stands out, is that she was not only willing to be a wife, but she was willing to be a mother to orphan children. Children whom were not her own. They did not come from her. Children who were bereaved, their mother was taken from them. And imagine how, 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 heavy that was on their hearts. And it's hard for any person, she was not obliged to enter into that situation. It was not a forced marriage. It was not you know, an arranged marriage or anything like that. It was a marriage completely by choice. The story tells us that when Aqil approached the family of Umm al-Banin, who was later to be known as Umm al-Banin, that they consulted, the father consulted with his wife and consulted with his daughter, consulted with Umm al -Bani. And I'll mention what happened when, when they consulted. But she came into a home where there were orphans. And that was, that was a very tough situation. Not only did she love these orphans, not only did she accept them as her own, but in some cases she showed more devotion to them than she did to her own children. And we know the story of how she heard of the martyrdom of her four sons and she kept asking about Hussein, who was not her son. But she considered him 
to be her son. That devotion to the family of the Prophet, to the, to the household of the Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt, the devotion which, which superseded the devotion to her own children, her own sons. And it, it was not like her sons were just any random sons, you know, regular average Joes. We're talking about Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and his three brothers who one by one gave up their lives in devotion. These are, these are no ordinary sons. But still on top of that, she recognizes the favor and the special status of the grandsons of Rasulullah, Al-Hasan wal Hussein, and Zainab and Umm Kulthum. She took them in as her own. And so, really Amir al-Mu'mineen was looking for the right place to plant the right seeds so that they can emerge and the fruit would bear. And that fruit that would bear would fulfill a very great responsibility, a very great task. And this reminds us of some of the ahadith, some of the directions of the Prophet. The Prophet, he says, in choosing a spouse, this is a very famous hadith. He says, اِخْتَارُوا لِنُطَفِكُمْ فَإِنَّ الْعِرْقَ دَسَّاسِ Very, very important hadith. He says, literally, this is what the Prophet is saying. He says, choose your repository. Choose where you are planting your seed. Meaning when you choose a spouse who will be the father of your children or the mother of your children, choose the right repository. فَإِنَّ الْعِرْقَ دَسَّاسِ إِنَّ is, what does that mean? Surely, عرق, what is عرق? In Arabic, the word عرق is the root. Araq or rag. It's the root. It's, the, it's, it's, the, it's basically the, the vein, what we call. Right? That, that important part, the root. فَإِنَّ الْعِرْقَ دَسَّاسِ Dasas means it penetrates, it permeates, it goes through. So, he says when you are looking at a potential spouse, look at their origin. Look at their root. Look at where they are emerging from. Don't look at the plant and say, this is such a beautiful plant. It's such a pretty flower. Look at where it is emerging. In another hadith, it says, uh, the Prophet says, beware, in his wording, he says, beware of the flower which grows and emerges out of the garbage. Sometimes you'll see garbage. But then out of that garbage, you'll see a flower is popping out. He says, he says, don't be fooled by the pretty little petals, or maybe it smells nice. The root, the origin is no good. So be wary, be careful. It's like taking a seed, right here in, in the United States, in California specifically, and if you go to the Midwest. But here if you, in California, if you go up north, they have all types of fruits, all types of delicious fruits that you can... You know, they sell them on the road. They're, they, they're so cheap, you can, you can pick up, you know, they have 10 avocados for a dollar, very cheap. In the supermarket here, you buy them for two or three dollars, but up north, because it's so abundant, it becomes cheap. There's a, there's a very high supply so that it becomes devalued, it becomes cheaper. The state is known for this. Now, it's known for this because of what? There's great weather. There's great soil. There's a place which can receive the seed. So if you take those seeds, those very same seeds, and you go to the North Pole, you're probably not going to get the same fruits, the same quality fruit. Or if you take it to another part of the world where the weather is not so great, the climate isn't so great, the soil isn't great, what's going to happen? It's not going to bear the proper fruits, the delicious fruit. But when you put it in the right repository, it will bear the right fruit. So this is why the Prophet says, And this is what Amir al-Mu'mineen was doing. He was looking for the right climate. He was looking for the right soil. And he found that in the character and the person of Umm al -Banin, Because she came from a noble family, a noble lineage. She was honored with great characteristics. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, 
in the case of a firm root, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alam tara kayfa darab Allahu mathalan, kalimatan tayyibatan, kashajaratin tayyibatin, asluha thabitun wa far'uha fi sama. God strikes a method, method, an example, a parable of a good word, kalimatan tayyiba, kashajaratin tayyiba. It is like a good tree. Asluha thabit, this good tree has a very firm and stable root. Wa far'uha fi sama, its far, its branches extend into the sky. And it keeps on giving its fruit. It keeps on bearing its fruit. And this is an example that God strikes. And then the verse after speaks about the exact opposite. There is also an example, an evil word like an evil tree. And this evil tree is not stable. It is not firm in its root. And according to the allegorical tafsir, of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, one of the, one of the tafasir, one of the allegories that the, this is re- referring to, is that the firm tree and the firm root represents the family of the Prophet, for they are firm in belief. And the branches and the leaves are represented by the family members and the true followers of the Ahlul Bayt, the awliya, those who have an established connection with them. And so the tree, the good tree, refers to a good people. And there is an evil tree, which also refers to an evil people. You know, the early days of Islam and and even after, there was a fair share of evil people and evil families, which tried to destroy Islam from within the inside. And again, it is important to understand that what the Imam was trying to do as he was preparing to to choose a spouse. Because, again, the root is very important. When you have nobility in the family, when you have honor in the family, when you have good characteristics, then it will produce good. But when there is nothing but evil which comes from a family, when there is nothing but bad characteristics and bad habits and bad customs which emerges from a family, then it, is also, then it is almost impossible for good to emerge from it. I'll give you an example. The Prophet Nuh, and this is mentioned in Surah Nuh in the Quran. The Prophet Nuh had spent how many years with his people preaching? The Quran says 1,000 minus 50, 950 years. 1,000 minus 50, 950. So 950 years he's preaching to to these people. Not six months, not one year, 950 years. After the 950 years, very, very patient man. I don't know how he exceeded 900 years. 950 years, he's had enough. And so like the other prophets that came before, except for the Prophet Muhammad (laughs) who never asked Allah to punish his people or annihilate his people. Rather, he kept asking for mercy because he was sent as rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy for the mankind. The other prophets, and rightfully so, I mean 950 years, you're spending with a group of people. I think it's okay if they're torturing you and they want to kill you. I think it's okay to ask Allah to punish them. My opinion, I don't know. But for 950 years, it should be okay. What does he say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to punish his people with the flood. And among those people punished, Surah Al-Tahreem mentions his wife. So just because she was related to him, didn't benefit her because she was fighting against him. And also his son, his sons who are also old in age, you know how they have a You know, a a father has a disobedient son when he's around adolescent years, 14, 15, 16. His son was around that age. He was around 450 years old. So he was going through those teenage years, very rebellious. He didn't want to follow his father, and so he was annihilated. So when Allah tells, when, when, when the decision is there in the making to annihilate these people, to destroy them, 
Nuh says, and this is in uh, this is in Surah Nuh. He says, "Waqala Nuh, Rabbi la tadar ala al-ardi min al-kafirin dayara." O Lord, annihilate them. Don't keep a single one of these misbelievers. Inna ka intadarhum. Nuh is telling Allah that if you and Nuh is, is uh, in our view, he's infallible. He's not only speaking because he's fed up. He has seen the evil in these people. He has seen how generation after generation, there's no good emerging from them. If you leave them alone, they will misguide your people. They will misguide the generations to come. That they will give birth only to immoral and ungrateful people. They will not produce any good people. That's it. They have done so much evil. It has permeated so much in them that there is, there's no ability to produce. It's like if, if you were to pour poison into the soil and you were to burn the soil and you were to remove it from the sunlight and you were to remove any ability for it to produce good, this is how it was with these people. There was no ability to produce good. And so that's why we come back to when choosing a spouse, and Amir al-Mu'mineen was very clear about this. He understood this concept. That you take from a soil which is pure. You take from a soil which is fertile. And he found the perfect woman. He found the perfect spouse for the perfect mission. He knew he needed a lady who came from a noble family known for their bravery. He knew that there would be some tough times coming ahead. And so nobility is important. When I, when I speak about nobility, I don't mean pray and fast and hajj and zakat. Nobility is when you have high morals, when you have good characteristics, which is just as important in, as prayer and fasting and hijab. You can have all of these things, but if you don't have, if you don't do the right thing, if you don't have integrity, if people do not feel safe around you, if you are deceitful, then none of that matters. Because the Prophet said, Al Muslimu man salim al nasu min lisanihi wa yadih. A Muslim is he who other people are safe, salima, meaning they are free from, they are safe from his lisan, his tongue, meaning his speech, wa yadih, his actions. This is the definition of a Muslim according to Rasulullah. So he found a noble woman. He approached his brother, and his brother approached the family, approached the father of Fatima bint Hizam. He approached Hizam, this man, from the tribe of Kilab, a noble tribe. And so he said, I will seek the counsel of my wife and my daughter. And so he sought the counsel of his wife, and his wife said that, if you believe that our daughter has the right characteristics to be the spouse of Ali ibn Abi Talib, that she can take care of his needs, then of course, absolutely. And so he consulted his daughter, Umm al -Banin. When they consulted, it is narrated that Umm al told them that she had just seen a dream. And in that dream, she was sitting in a garden, a luscious garden, a beautiful garden. Now dreams, before I continue, dreams, Sometimes dreams come true and sometimes they are not true. For the righteous people, dreams most of the time are true. For those who are not so righteous, or it doesn't always depend on righteousness, but for any other circumstance, sometimes the dreams are not always true. A lot of people, when they see a bad dream, they let it affect them throughout the day and throughout the week and throughout the uh, throughout the year and throughout their entire lives and all of their decisions are based on something which probably means nothing at all. And the, and, and the Quran speaks about dreams which are sadiq, which are true or legitimate, and some of them which are not. The ones that are not, they're mentioned in Surah Yusuf. They are referred to as adghathu ahlam. Right, this is mentioned in, in the story of Yusuf. When the king saw a dream, and there were people who were incompetent. They could not interpret the dream. They said, Adghathu Ahlam. This is just a fake dream. But it had meaning. 
And so they went to Yusuf and Allah says about Yusuf uh, that we taught him ta'wilul ahadith. We taught him the allegory, the deeper meanings behind events or behind visions. And so he was able to interpret dreams. He himself has a dream that 11 planets and the sun and the moon are prostrating to him. And when that comes true at the end of the story, he says to his father, وَقَالَ يَا أَبَتِ هَذَا تَأْوِيلُ رُؤْيَايَ قَدْ جَعَلَهَا رَبِّي حَقَّ Because he tells his father in the beginning, and his father says, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone about this dream. And in the end, he says, my father, this is my dream. After he sees that they prostrate to him in reverence, not in worship, but in reverence, his 11 siblings and his mother and his father, he says, this is my dream, it has come true. So his dream was true. The dream of the two prisoners was also true. The dream of the king was also true. The dream of Ibrahim, when he was slaughtering his son, was also true. The dream of the Prophet Muhammad Muhammad wa In Surah Al-Fatih, when he sees himself entering Mecca to conquer Mecca, that is also true because, because the Muslims did conquer Mecca. So this dream, and Umm al banin was a righteous lady, was true. She saw that she was sitting in a garden and she looked up at the moon and then the moon came into her lap and sat in her lap. And there were stars around and four of the stars descended and also sat in her lap. And so she had just seen that dream and it was a true dream. And so she was married to Amir al-Mu'mineen representing the moon and she bore four very noble men. Al-Abbas and his three brothers who all gave their life on the day of Ashura for, for their brother, for their, for their master, for their Sayyid, their master. And when she was informed of the news, bereaved of her four children, you know, sometimes it's very, very hard to imagine because we didn't see any of this with our eyes. But we believe what happened and we sympathize with what happened. The Prophet says that the best of people are those who will believe in me but they will not see me. Those are the best of people. Because they didn't see what happened. We didn't see what happened, but we believe in it. And Umm al banin was not there. She did not see what happened. But four of her children were taken from her. And then the fifth, the most important one to her, was her son, Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. And the narrations say that when she heard, some of the narrations say that she was carrying a child on her back. And she fell and she began to weep and she began to lament. And she spent the rest of her life lamenting Imam Hussein. She spent the rest of her life spreading the message. She spent the rest of her life eulogizing. And although she was in her youth, she was in her prime after Amir al-Mu'mineen had passed away, and they say that she was also a very beautiful woman, but she never remarried as a sign of devotion. There was no compensation or nothing, but just, just to respect whom Amir al-Mu'mineen was and to devote her life to raising her sons for this very important task. You can imagine raising the child from the time that their father passes away till the time that they have to carry out this mission many years. Living under the rule of Muawiyah, for, Muawiyah ruled for about 20 years. From around the year 40 or 41 after Hijrah till the year 60. 61. And this is when Yazid became Khalifa in, in that year where Ashura. So for 20 years raising her sons, preparing them for one day, one moment, a few hours. And we see the, the valiance of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas when he goes out into the battlefield and with, with courage and with might and with nobility and with integrity. See, integrity is when you are able to do the right thing. When you have integrity, no matter how much hardship there is, you're able to do the right thing. And when he placed his hands in the cool 
water, the fresh water. It ran through his hands. And Imam al-Sadiq describes his uncle. The hadith of either Imam al-Baqir or I believe Imam al-Sadiq one of them. He says, كَانَ قَلْبْ عَمِّيَ الْعَبَّاسِ كَصَالِيَةِ الْجَمْرِ مِنَ الظَّمَى He says, the heart of my uncle, Al-Abbas, was like a burning piece of charcoal from thirst, because he was so thirsty. And he placed his hands in the cool water. This is after many days of patience after the water was cut off. But yet he still... When the water runs in his hands, he remembers the right thing. He remembers his promise. No one would have blamed Al-Abbas. Do you think anyone would have blamed Al-Abbas if he took just one drink for himself? Nobody would have blamed him. Who would have blamed him? But he didn't care if people were to blame him or not blame him. He knew what was right, and he did what was right. And this was not a coincidence. This type of integrity requires training. It requires training from the mother. It requires a mother who is pure, a mother who is loving, to train her children to be so valiant and people of character and integrity. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the intercession of Ummul Banin and the intercession of her sons and the intercession of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. And again, as we, as we commemorate this dear lady, this honorable lady, we also congratulate you for this very auspicious occasion. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring upon us a year of sustenance and a year of blessings and a year of forgiveness. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon all of us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma khfir lil-mu'minina wal-mu'minat wal-muslimina wal-muslimat. Al-ahya'i minhum wal-amwat taba' baynana wa baynahum bil-khayrat. إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير. Brothers and sisters, let us recite uh, this ayah five times for those who are ill and those who are in need of our assistance, inshallah, and for ourselves. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ الفاتحة مع الصلوات.